Hi, and welcome to Connected Conversations for Creatives, a place where creatives like you can learn, grow, and connect. I'm your host, Jennifer Carr. Creativity is not just a solitary act reserved for artists, writers, and performers. It's a dynamic force that influences and intertwines with our daily experiences, shaping the way we think, problem solve, and connect with the world around us. From the simplest tasks to the most complex endeavors, creativity is a thread that weaves through the fabric of our lives. At its core, however, creativity is just the ability to generate ideas and solutions. It's about thinking beyond the obvious and finding fresh perspectives. In our daily routines, creativity often surfaces when we face challenges, whether it's devising a new recipe with limited ingredients, finding an innovative solution to a work problem, or even deciding how to entertain a group of restless children on a rainy day. Creativity is our ally. Today's guest has explored a diverse range of creative fields from veterinary medicine, stage acting, public speaking, and eventually finding their calling as a novelist. But this conversation isn't just about his personal journey. It's about how creativity is a common thread that links us all. Creativity isn't confined to one discipline or another. So whether you're an artist, a writer, a performer, or simply someone who appreciates the beauty of creativity in everyday life, this episode is for you. John Bukowski, an avid reader and writer who has explored many avenues of expressing his creativity, is here to share his insights on the mechanics of writing, establishing a routine for writing, as well as generating ideas through what he calls the what-if scenario. Now, without further delay, I'd like to welcome to the show, John Bukowski. Hi, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, thank you for being here. I would love for you to just give us a little background. Your background sounds fascinating, like you've been here, there, and everywhere. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how you found yourself at this Uh, current juncture in life. Yeah, I like to describe myself as perhaps the most overeducated fiction writer in America. (laughs) Um, If we go back to my school, grade school, high school, undergrad, I liked most of it. I'm one of those weirdos who liked school. Uh, I loved history. I loved English and writing. Uh, and I was love science. I have a very logical mind, I think, and I was drawn to science. So as I went into undergrad, I, I focused on science, and I pursued a veterinary degree. Always loved animals, uh, and uh, I practiced veterinary medicine in southeastern Michigan, the Detroit area, where I grew up, for about uh, seven years. And during that time, a lot of people don't really know, but at least you, you have to think from the veterinarian's perspective, it's a stressful occupation. You're seeing lots of people, lots of animals. Uh, there's a risk to your own personal injury, as well as you're playing God a lot, which mm-hmm. uh, is hard to take after a while. So I started redirecting my interests toward research. And uh, I went on and got a master's in public health and then a PhD in epidemiology. And for those of you who don't know, epidemiology is the study of disease patterns in populations, what's so-called disease detective work. It is not the study of the skin or the study of bugs, as people often think it is. Um, but so I, uh, I did that, and I actually worked in for about 15, 20 years in government, uh, academia, and industry. And I noticed an odd thing as I was working. I was doing research less and writing more. My bosses, whether whatever, uh, industry, academia, whatever, recognized that I could write right well, and I enjoyed the writing. So I, I figured, well, I would transition from that because I was working for a large uh, chemical company for uh, quite a few years. And I was, if you ever worked in a big corporation, uh, it kind of gets to you after a while. So I transitioned from that into medical or technical writing. My wife, who's also a veterinarian, has, uh, is a very well-respected medical editor. And she had her own private company called Word, Words World Consulting. So I joined that. And things were going pretty well. We were doing well. I was, I was uh, got quite a few clients until about 2008, 2009, the Great Recession hit. Mm-hmm. And companies were no longer hiring freelance writers. Uh, they were tucking in. So fortunately, my wife still had a lot of established clients that were had worked with her for a lot of years. So we, were, we had money coming in. But I had time on my hands. Now, if you talk to anybody who's ever been a writer, um, a technical writer, a script writer, a copywriter for uh, an ad agency, we all love to write the great American novel. We all want to write fiction. I'm an avid reader, reader all my life, and I've always been fascinated by how people can put these stories together. So I uh, had some time on my hands. I said, if you're going to write this a book, you better start. So about six, eight months later, I actually finished the first draft. Uh, that book is still sitting on my computer somewhere. It's what Stephen King would call a trunk novel. I guess now they call them computer novels. And But it got me started. It got me hooked. So even after business picked up in around 2010, I kept writing, wrote some short stories, uh, started another novel, and 
probably around 2016 or so, I was finally at a point in my career, my finances, where I could go to uh, fiction writing full time. And so I kept going at it and uh, got my first book published uh, last year. That was Project Suicide. As, as you see the cover. Nice. And this year I have another one through the same publisher. And that is Checkout Time. Both nice covers, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that brings me here today. Excellent. You have the, the, the diverse background of experiences you have. Um, how have you found that you've creativity has just kind of found its way into all of them because my, my brother-in-law is a vet and that's always that was always his dream was to be a vet and it is one of the most stressful it's actually dentistry and uh, veterinary medicine both have like the highest rate of suicide when it comes to um, professions is and which is it, it's wild and bizarre but you're right there is a lot of um, stress that comes with it because you are having to interact with both people and animals and there is a, a, a high level of stress and threat there um, but how let's let's keep it lighthearted, baby um, but how has creativity impacted just your your journey as you've made these different transitions? Have you seen that um, kind of weave its way through? Um, yeah, creativity. I mean, certainly uh, one of the reasons I was successful as a researcher, uh, you be able to think outside the box, mm -hmm. find solutions that other people, you know, have been just jamming ahead and not be able to find. That's good and bad. In some respects, you get a lot of respect. In other respects, you're seen as a, as a troublemaker. You're, you're not towing, especially in corporations. They have a very state way of doing things. And that's true with medical writing as well. Uh, most of it is very cookbook. Uh, a journal article has a certain, you know, background, uh, uh, procedure, results, discussion, blah, blah, blah. And it's all very... So I started looking more and more for things that were like... Uh, uh, I did some radio scripts on veterinary medicine for University of Florida. I did uh, uh, advertorials, which are kind of like part science, part advertising that doctors uh, get handed to them by uh, sales reps and stuff like that. Uh, website content for people. Things like that that were a little more creative, I was naturally drawn to. So naturally, I went to the even more creative uh, extreme of fiction writing, where, man, it's all you, boy. Whatever you can think of, you can, if you can figure out how to put on that page that people believe, go for it. Um, but along the way, also, I've uh, uh, when I, especially when I was working for corporations, I found other creative outlets. I did a lot of stage acting, uh, mostly community theater, but a couple of regional theaters that we actually got paid and uh, uh, had a lot of fun doing that. And I also note that, and as you mentioned, there's an awful lot of people who are creative in more than one area artistically. Uh, you'll see people like uh, the late Tom Tryon, who was a very good character actor and sometimes star. And uh, he started as a painter, was very good at that. Uh, went on and became a novelist. Very good at that. I just read his Harvest Home not long ago. Excellent book. I highly recommend it. And you see lots of actors go into writing, uh, directing, uh, painting after they retire and stuff like that. I think it's a common thread uh, that uh, artistic creativity covers uh, many facets of a person's life. I do too. And I think a lot of that stems from having this natural curiosity about us. Um, you know, we, we, want to, we want to know, and I know that... Um, having a background in research also kind of helps uh, when you are writing fiction um, because that was probably one of my favorite parts of grad school was the the research and the writing that went along with it. And then being able to do that research because I want to know how things work. I want to know, you know, what is the correct answer to this? You know, I want to know how to portray this. And so just having that natural curiosity that leads me to want to provide an answer, even if nobody's asked the question. I'm like, somebody surely has asked this question. And so that's how right. it turns into fiction writing for me. Right. <laughs> and so right. it's just this curiosity. <laughs> well, that's all science fiction is, is basically a background in scientific fact, <laughs> which is then extrapolated on, speculated about, and all done in an interesting and hopefully uh, believable way. Exactly, exactly. And it's really, it's, I've been working on a, and it's so far on the back burner, but I come back to it pretty regularly, but it's not something that's going to be ready anytime soon, but I have a science fiction slash, you know, urban fantasy. It's kind of a combination in the works. And um, that one requires a lot of brain power, but it's also the one that I can so easily get lost in because it's just imagination and curiosity and research and um, yeah. keeping up with the logical plans and steps for the story. Um, so, yeah, um, 
<laughs> I, was, I took a pause there to see if there was any response. Um, so what aspects of writing fiction um, do you find most fascinating? What's your favorite part? Because if you do come at it from the logical academia side, you, you risk, you know, losing the entertainment value. But if you come at it too creatively, you risk, you know, being too dull for maybe the brainiacs that want a deeper connection. Right. And, and, that, and that's a good point because both my novels, especially the first one, Project Suicide, but both of them are what you might call techno, a uh, uh, techno thriller, something like that, like Michael Crichton would write or Robin Cook. And you're right, there is has to be a balance because I like to think of the research as kind of the spice to the soup. It's the thing that gets people hooked. I, I often say that fiction writers have the most in common with confidence men, con men, because we're both selling lies. And to get people hooked on a lie, to follow along, there has to be a touch of reality. There has to be a touch of realism. They have to trust you. Um, so you have to bring enough of that in so they say, this guy knows what he's talking about, or, or girl, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm going to follow along. And later on, when he throws in the BS, I'm going to swallow that too because he's got me hooked. Um, so that's part of the you know, fiction writing. Uh, the research is important. But as you say, you can't have so much of it that people roll their eyes and start flipping pages. Uh, and there's a tendency sometimes for writers to do that because you've learned something and you want to pass it on. But you have to remember, you're not writing a technical manual. It's not about the research. It's about the characters, what they're struggling with, how their uh, co conflicts go, how they're overcoming obstacles to reach the goal. Yes. And I'm, I'm one of those readers where, especially if I'm reading, and, and when I read, it's I'm reading something that I'm probably you know, in some form or fashion familiar with the topic that even in fiction that is happening. And so if there's something that I'm like, well, that's not how that works. You know, it pulls me out of the story and I'm no longer right. invested that's, in the story. That's a, that's a big danger. Yes, exactly. So you have a, you have a workshop, you offer a workshop or have created a workshop yeah. um, about I, I, using research in fiction. So maybe, maybe let's talk about that. I just uh, did that for the first time at the Imaginarium Conference in uh, Louisville, Kentucky uh, in July. And basically, as I said, research is important because it's that spice, it's that hook that gets you, it, it gets people to believe you. And there was a time, uh, not that long ago, probably before your time, when research of any kind, certainly when I was an undergraduate and stuff, research was onerous because you had to go to libraries, you had to talk to librarians, which always loved to help, by the way. Uh, you had to look through card catalogs, uh, articles, encyclopedias, they were very useful, uh, microfilm and microfiche. Uh, projectors and call up people and interview experts, go talk to experts, uh, visit locations. Then the internet was born and what used to take you days to months now takes hours to days, mm -hmm. all at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. And so the tendency is to draw a lot of research out there. And when you found out something that got you excited and you want to show how smart you are because you found us, you want to put it on the page. And as we said, that can really draw you out of the reader, out of the story, and make it boring. Because it's not a technical manual. It's a, it's a fiction novel. Uh, so I only have about one, maybe one and a half pages on where to find stuff, you know, Google and other things like that. And the rest of it is, is what to put in and what to leave out, which mm -hmm. is even most important, I think. So that's what most of I, I, I talk about in, uh, in that workshop. I'm always reminded of my father who passed away about 25 years ago. Uh, he wasn't an educated man. He had to drop out of high school for uh, to work during the Depression. He was born in 1914. And, uh, but he loved to read. And he had a job where he was kind of sitting at a machine all day. And there was a lot of time when he could sit down and read. So he went through probably about 50, 100 novels uh, a year. And he used to love James Michener. Those great, big, fat Texas and Centennial and all those Poland. He loved Poland. He was, he was pure Polish. And, uh, I used to say to him, well, Dad, those have you know, tens to 100 pages or more of technical material about geologic formations and the history. And the, and he goes, I skip those. <laughs> and that can, you can, James Mitchell can get by with that. But you as a fiction writer, you, you don't want to risk that. You don't want people to start skipping uh, your writing because you're in love with your own research. So that's, that's a good part of using research and fiction is knowing what to leave out, killing your darlings. Um, so how, do you, how does the the term write what you know, how would that play into that? Because I think for me, that's that's 
that's where I draw a lot of my my information from and, and my inspiration from is what I already know. But, you know, I also don't want to dwell too much on what I know because there are so many other things out there that could also play into that. Well, that's that's very common now for writers, usually established writers, to say, write what you know is the biggest BS to tell anybody. You know, you don't want to write what you know, you want to blah, 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 blah. Well, when you're starting out especially, writing what you know and basically what you're already interested in, what you already have knowledge about, is a big advantage. Because, I mean, there's a reason why Robin Cook wrote about medical thrillers. He was a doctor. Michael Crichton, ditto. Why are Stephen King's characters usually drunken uh, English teachers? That was his background. Um, when you write what you know, uh, you bring an automatic authenticity to the writing. You don't get these moments where people go, hey, that's not how that works. What you hopefully get is, wow, I never know that worked that way. I'm, I'm seeing behind the scenes in something. I, I'm an insider now. And write what you know, uh, that's what write what you know gives you. My first novel, Project Suicide, which is about a, how a cure for Alzheimer's is perverted into an assassination drug. That was right in my wheelhouse. I've done epidemiologic research. I managed a bioterrorism website for like three years for a company. And so that kind of stuff, I mean, I had to look some things up like about genetics and stuff like that, but I knew where to look and I knew how to simplify it so the reader wouldn't uh, turn their, you know, say, I, I, I don't get this, I'm, I'm lost. So, I mean, it's that's why I think write what you know is so important, especially when people are starting out. Now, does that mean a plumber can't write about courtroom dramas? No, but I wouldn't do that as the first book and I would do a lot of research because nothing gets people, especially when you're talking about medicine, or things like that that a lot of people are familiar with. There's a lot of doctors, nurses, people have been in hospitals. When you start flinging around wrong terms and stuff, people start to laugh and they put the book down. And the problem is they're never going to read another one of your books because you've already convinced them. You don't know what you're talking about. So write what you know. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a biggie in my book. I agree. I And, and you know, that's... It's so much easier and, and you're, you're more comfortable as a writer when you're writing those things. But you can also, you know, even if it's something that you know, you can even collaborate with other authors, writers, people from, you know, my background is psychology. So other psychologists, counselors, therapists, those kinds of things, um, you know, you can collaborate with other people, which I think is something that um, that you tout as very important when it comes to the arts community is is collaborating and supporting each other as opposed to competing with one another. So let's talk about that and how artists and community go hand in hand. Yeah, I, I think they do. You know, talk about artists working together rather than competing each other it, with the written word. That's kind of what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've done a lot of acting. And anybody will tell you, any actor who's worth his salt will tell you no matter how good they are. It starts with the script. I cannot make the words up. I can change inflection, intention. I can even play around with punctuation to make my point. Uh, but the writer is where it starts. Any, any, if you think of any great movie uh, or any sitcom that you even like, it's all about the writing. They are, they are the start. And I mean, we, we, they just dealt with the actor strike or the writer strike in Hollywood, and the actors went out on strike too. I think part of that was a show of solidarity, yeah. but part of it was real realism. I can't do my craft if you guys aren't writing. Um, I have I, I I've, I've been involved with many uh, old standards in community theater, things like uh, uh, the Crucible and uh, Our Town and Harvey and different different things. It's all great writing, but I've also been involved with some. Uh, amateur productions that have uh, unproduced plays being done for the first time. And if it's flat, if the writing is flat and you can't change it as an actor, it's difficult to make it enter entertaining. I mean, you can do gestures, you can change inflection, like I said, try to ground, ground your character in uh, intentions that, are, that, that fit their objectives, but there's only so much you can do. So I think right now that's, that's what happens. And you see an awful lot of uh, writers who are very good to become directors, people like Michael Mann and uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino, for example. They, they, uh, a lot of actors who become writers, like we talked about, Tom Tryon. Uh, I think there's an awful lot of interaction that way. Oh yeah, and I think that um, we, we get in, the, in our heads that we have to compete for first place, we have to compete for bestseller, we have to compete against one another. And I'm thinking um, some of my most successful 
work is done when I have input from other people, when I have support from other people, and whether they're, you know, actively contributing information, for instance, um, just knowing that they are there and they're offering their support. Sometimes that's just the mental block that you need, you know, it gets you past that mental yeah. block saying, well, oh, I've got people in my corner. <laughs> right. Well, that's the whole idea of the beta reader. Uh, mm -hmm. Having someone, once you've got your first draft, or usually your second draft, where you think someone can take a look at it, get some writer, some editor that you trust, to read through it and give you feedback. You know, you the feedback may not be what you want to hear, but it's what you need to hear. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's vital. You just can't, you can't really exist just seeing it through your own eyes. You need to see how other people see it because you as the creator, you can never see it as other people see it really. Oh, absolutely. It's so hard to separate yourself when you are the creator of it. Um, I, I did not use beta readers for my first book. And um, I just, I kick myself, you know, looking back because I did use beta readers. And, and, you know, it was my first time. I had no real idea exactly what I was doing. I'm self-published, learning as I go kind of thing. Um, and I knew it was a good book and I had a professional editor. So there was that. And she was, you know, she was helpful with the developmental part of it. But at the same time, that was not her goal was, you know, to help me develop the story as much. And so my second book, I did use beta readers. And let me tell you, it was, it was like, not only had I learned from the first writing experience, but also just to have that feedback from multiple different people, uh, including um, I, I changed editors as well, who, who took on part of the developmental um, editing role. But it was just, it was so much better. And, and it makes me a better writer just to have that collaboration. And that's not even like a professional level, because you're talking just everyday readers who want to read the story and give feedback. And so that is so useful. So what does your, did you use beta readers for one or both of your books? And, and what does yeah, that process I, look I, like I for you? For, for both of the books, and especially I got some uh, feedback on the beginnings of both books from some established writers at conferences where you get to 10 pages and stuff. Because the beginning is really the most important because what are people going to go by? If they don't know you as a, if you're Stephen King, oh yeah, they may just grab the book. Um, if they don't know you, they're going to look at the cover, so you're going to want a cover that is engaging. Uh, they're going to read the little blurb in the back, so you want to write that well. I think I do a pretty good job writing those blurbs up. And then they're going to start reading the first few pages. Now, if you're not solid in the first few pages, they're probably going to put the book back. On. So, yeah, it's uh, I, I did use beta readers both for the entire books. And you also mentioned uh, uh, editors. And people don't realize how important editors are. And I'm not just talking about grammar and punctuation and things like that. Yes, my wife's a professional editor for nonfiction, so she always reads through my books for that before it goes to anybody else. But uh, you want that fiction editor. Someone who, I always say the fiction editor is kind of like your relationship to a physical therapist. They help you a great deal, but you hate them. And you hate them because they're telling you some stuff you love needs to be changed if you want it to be better. And... Uh, so that's what the fiction editor does. It is the professional who has read a lot of fiction, knows how to make it better, and reads it like a reader. You know, knows where the reader's going to say, you know, this is a wonderful description, but it goes on for a page and a half right when you're getting rolling in your in your climax. You, you, know, you don't want that to be. You don't want it to pull people out of the, out of the story. And things like that. And I would say uh, the, the fiction editor that I've worked with at uh, Pathfinder, which is my publisher, uh, he is, he's excellent, a guy named uh, Doug Watchover, I believe. And uh, he's, uh, he's excellent, and uh, I probably take 85, 90% of his suggestions. Um, and, and an editor is the one thing that I will I will tout louder than anything. And I've said it over and over again, like probably every other episode you hear me say, you know, if there's one thing that I will tell authors of any level, like, get to working with a good editor, someone who will do your work justice, but it will also remain looking like your work, you know, that they're not going to try to imprint their, their um, right. writing style and that kind of thing on your work, but will also be honest with you and help you. Like your mom is probably not going to be your most um, effective editor. You know what I mean? Now I am lucky and, and blessed in the sense that my sister is my editor, but that's a slightly different relationship because siblings are not afraid to tell you when you've done something wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. That's why some of my critics are my siblings. But, uh, but yeah, you're, you're right. That goes with beta readers, too. You, the, I always tell people if they're going to do a beta read, I say, I really liked it or I, I didn't like it. Don't help me. Tell me why. Yes. And, and tell me exactly what you think.
Yes, I have. I have. And, and you don't want them to be your best friend. I mean, best friends are great, but they're going to tickle your ears. You know, spouses right. are great. They're going to want to tell you how great you are. So you have to make sure that you find people who are not attached to you. And so I have like an entire application process. You know, I'm making sure that if you're going to read this, that you're probably my target reader, because I have had an instance where one of my beta readers, I, I was like, Okay, uh, you have a background in English and reading. And so if you wanted to take, you know, take some technical look at it, but she was not my target audience. So the story did not stick for her. Like it was right. not a it was not a good fit. And so when she gave me her feedback, one, it hurt because she was telling me all the things wrong with the story. And I was like, mm, let me take a step back and 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 think about this from the simple fact that you were the only person who had this reaction. So I'm going to assume that you were not the person for this. And, and that is, that is fine. It's when you get two or three people who give you the same right. feedback or people who are, you, you know, uh, I've been, been in writing groups and people will say things like, this isn't my genre, but well, when you start with, this isn't my genre, you automatically are saying, I'm going to, I'm going to take what you're saying with less, with a grain of salt because you're not the kind of reader that I go to. Exactly. And, but I do, I will say that those beta readers have been game changers because in, with my, with my second book, um, those beta readers gave me information, one that I was already thinking myself, I just needed somebody to give me the kick in the pants to be like, just do the work and fix this. Um, because it was, it wasn't just me that had picked up on it. Other people had seen it too. And so I was like, okay, fine. Um, you know, so they, that's an excellent, um, a source of collaboration is working with those beta readers. And um, do you have, how do you choose yours? How do you, how do you go through that process? Well, that, I have one that's been a long-standing friend for many writers' conferences that I use oh, just about all the time. And my wife gives me feedback as well, because she's a fiction reader, even though she's a nonfiction editor. Um, I have some trusted authors that I can send like 10 pages to um, that uh, <clears throat> they will especially, especially help with a tough spot or with uh, um, the, the opening. And uh, then you're, you're on the lookout for people. You know, you're talking to somebody at a conference and they seem to click with you as far as the types of books you like to read and stuff. And you say, hey, would you, know, would you be interested in reading a chapter or reading uh, uh, the opening or reading the whole book, potentially? Nice. Um, you've mentioned writing conferences several times. What's your favorite one and what, that you would recommend? Well, there's, there's a couple that I've go to uh, over the past several years. One of them is the Imaginarium Conference in uh, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And that is kind of a real eclectic mix it's got game designers and actors and writer fiction writers and screenwriters and uh people doing independent films all come together including people in costume and stuff like that so it's kind of a fun couple of days and there's another one that's also a midwestern one called this midwest writers workshop in Muncie, Indiana and ball state and that's a very good i've gotten a lot of good feedback and stuff there there are bigger conferences i've been to uh thriller fest in uh new york city a few years ago and uh, that was that was very interesting. You hear you hear from a lot of a lot of good uh, information from very high powered writers, people who are are, are uh, got to pet my dog here for a minute, who are uh, uh, you know best selling authors or who work in the uh, television industry and things like that. So that was very good. There's also a thing called uh, VoucherCon, which is for thriller writers uh, that changes locations I think every year. Uh, Killer Nashville, things like that. So there's lots of conferences out there. Uh, but the thing I think people should remember, although conferences are very good, you get good feedback, you get good uh, uh, recharge your batteries kind of things. Uh, I had somebody say at the conference, you know, conferences are great. You guys should really be home writing. You know, there's, there, are, there are people who do so much writing groups and conferences and stuff that they don't write. Mm -hmm. And so you have to, have to take that into consideration, uh, you know, it's one thing to recharge your batteries. It's another to make that your entertainment and your replacement for your writing. Yeah, you, you, you do it to feel productive and you're not being productive at all. Right, and, uh, right. Yeah. And a lot of people will say, I go to conferences, you know, to have time to write. It's like, I can't really write in a, in a situation like that. You know, I, I write at home in my writing space. All right, well, let's let's talk about that. You're sitting there at home writing. What kind of like how do you how do you maintain your productivity as a writer and what routines and practices do you use when you are sitting in your writing space? Right. Well, the yeah, idea is uh, and I've heard many people say this Stephen King among others. There's two things you need to do if you want to be a fiction writer. You got to read a lot and you got to write a lot. So there's no excuse for not writing every day or almost every day. 
and may, you may only get a chance to do a couple hundred words. Uh, you may have a good day and do like 1,200 words. And some people set themselves a word goal. I try to do 500 words, whatever. Some people say, I, I, I try to write for an hour, hour and a half, two hours. And it's hard. People get the impression that writers go off to a mountain cabin and write day and night for a month and come back with this bestseller. I don't know many people who can write that long and be productive. I'm, I'm an hour or two, and I need to uh, switch to a marketing thing or uh, submitting short stories or doing something like that. Um, some people, Stephen King says he does three hours, and he writes 2,000 words in that three hours, but that's Stephen King. Um, so again, it's, 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 I've also heard people say they don't believe in writer's block because there's no such thing as plumber's block. And even if you're not feeling it that day, just start writing. Uh, they always say the the real work is revising anyway. So you get stuff on the page that you can then make better later on. And it's hard to do, and I've fallen victim of that. You go off and do something else because you just can't think of anything right now. Um, but I've also had things where I said, you know, I've been working on this for two years. I'm just going to punish through and get the last 20,000 words done and then come back to it and revise it. And it's actually turned out quite well. Uh, so there's, uh, I guess, don't get discouraged when something like writer's block hits you, but try to power through it. I think that's good advice because a lot of times, um, I, writer's block for me is real, but that's, and it's in a, in the sense that I have so many other obligations, you know, I'm, right. I'm a homeschooling mom and I'm a wife and I have, you know, podcast and author stuff and, and, and all these things, different hats that I wear, um, you know, and I, and I teach during the week. And so it's, it's one of those situations where my brain's maybe it's more distraction than writer's block. And so sitting down and being able to focus on the creative side of writing is sometimes hard. So I think for me, a lot of times what I end up doing is I write something, even if it's not my creative stuff. So whether right. I'm writing, you know, a research something or a podcast something or a plan something just to move my brain and get it focused. Because sometimes it's just like I'm weaving in and off the track and I've just got to get right back on it. So sometimes right. it just requires me to sit and. Even if you're doing something like keeping a daily journal. Yeah. Uh, I say to people, you know, write, but not like texts. You know, I don't consider that really creative writing. But like journal writing, you know, that's creative. Noodling an idea for a short story, that kind of stuff, uh, mind mapping, that's all creative writing. And you just got to make time for it. Uh, I remember reading about Stephen King. He, uh, he's one of my, my influences. My three big influences are Hemingway, uh, Elmore Leonard, and Stephen King. I think you learned something specific from each of those. Um, but Stephen King would, in his early days, he was teaching, and he was working nights at a laundromat to make ends meet. And he would come home at like 1 in the morning. And they were living in a trailer. He would sit in the furnace room of the trailer with stuff on his, on his lap, a typewriter or a pad, and he would write after all of that. So, he, you know, he made time for it. And I think that's a, an important part of it is making time for it. If it is something that's important to you, you make time for it. And um, and that maybe maybe writing for you is the hobby at the moment, you know, and it's not something that, it's, you're, that you're passionate about, but maybe you want it to become a passion. Well, it's never going to become a passion if you don't make time for it. Right. Yeah. I, I, like to, I like to say that I, I put writers into different groups. There's the people who want to write. I want to write a book. You know, then there's the people who start books. You know, the, that, and that's because when you start with a great idea and all the juices are flowing and you're writing like 1,100, 1,200 words a day, you're going. That's deceiving because once you get past the opening and before you get to the climax, You've got an awful lot of space, the bulk of the book to do, the muddled middle. That's where people oftentimes say, they started that book, now I'm going to start another book. I hear people say, yeah, I start a lot of novels. Um, so there's people who start writing. Then there's people who actually can complete it. And that's a whole other level. And my hat off to anybody who can sit down and actually finish writing the novel. Uh, and then it's a matter of, uh, there's another group that take those and refine it to the point where maybe somebody wants to read it. Because we always delude ourselves. Well, we just wrote the greatest thing ever. But usually it needs a lot of work before people actually want to read it. Oh, yeah. And and I'm, I'm guilty on the one hand of being the one who has, I have probably three or four works in progress that where I've yeah. started. And I've gotten to that point where I'm like, oh, I love the way this book started. And then what do I do next? But I've got three that are done. So I feel pretty good about that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, right now I have uh, three or four which are in completed drafts of some kind. And I have two or three which I'm working on. A couple of them are pretty advanced. And so, yeah, you always, 
because that's what the writing, like you said, it's, it's the myth that you go to the mountain cabin and you, and, and you knock out the best seller. What typically happens, and this is what it's been for me, and I think for most writers, is you spend four months, six months, eight months, a year, depending on how quickly you write and circumstances, knocking out a first draft. Then you let it sit. You don't want to start revising it right away. It's too fresh. You need to see it with new eyes. So after a month or six weeks of working on something else, then you do your first revision. Maybe that takes you 10 days to two weeks. Then it's time to get a beta reader input, maybe. So you get that, get it out the beta, and, and while they're reading it and putting their comments together, you're doing something else. And you get it back, you take their comments into consideration and do another revision. And you maybe do two or three more revisions until you think it's to the point where the editor can look at it. And the editor looks at it, gives you their feedback, you know, and you do another revision. And then the, if everybody says it's good, they publish it and put out what used to be called the page proofs, and you go through it again, looking for final errors that, you know, this is continuity problem here, we got to change this. And that whole process takes from starting to work on the first draft until publication, one and a half to two years. Mm -hmm. So that's more the reality for people. And so I, writers always have something in the pipeline, because if, uh, and, and this is something that I've heard many established authors say to people, they say, however long it took you to write the book you've just you've completed now and people oftentimes would be five years six years you know he goes if it gets picked up they're going to the next one in a year mm -hmm. so think about that <laughs> yes it is it is amazing to me these these authors who and it's usually a very specific uh genre and it's usually found in in the romance rom-com genre oh, where yeah, they just yeah, they're yeah. pumping them out like every six months and i'm going how <laughs> Well, that's sometimes it, it, it's a formula. My wife it likes that she doesn't like romances because it's always the same story. The only thing that changes is the location and what they're wearing. Mm -hmm. um, so, so sometimes it's a formula. And sometimes with established writers like Patterson and stuff like that, they're not even writing them anymore. They have, uh, when I call them ghost writers, whatever, they have other people writing them in their style. And then they maybe spend a couple of weeks going through it and say, change this, that, this is more how I would do it, blah, blah, blah. And so, yeah, when you do that, you can have, you can turn out two, three knots a year. Yeah. And I, I personally, I like the the art of writing. I like the act of writing. I like the the getting lost in my imagination. And so I can't really see myself turning over the reins like that. And I definitely, I read the formula books. Don't get me wrong. I read them. Um, but that's not how I write because I'm like, ooh, my story needs to look different than <laughs> from all the others. So, yeah, I, I, yes. Uh, I, I don't like, I mean, I think I can tell the difference when I read something by a favorite author that's written by somebody else, uh, if, whether it's one of these situations with the ghostwriter or it's a uh, a series that the author's died and now someone else has taken it over. I used to love the Jesse Stone books by Robert Parker. And as soon as I tried to read the first one that was a Robert Parker, Jesse Stone, which means Robert Parker didn't write it by somebody else. And it's like you're reading a caricature. Mm. You know, there's always that tendency as you try to make it. Uh, it's, it's like with acting, the difference between internalizing the character and having that come through you, express it, and painting it on. You know, the yeah. kind of acting that, that some people do. Yes, where the lines are extremely blurred. Like there's really no separating actor from character. Oh yeah, um, and and that's that's what you should strive for in your writing too. That right. you know there should be no doubt that this was your work. Yeah, yeah and for me. Um, acting and writing are very relatable because as an actor, you take what is already written and you create a character using that and you're doing research and you're doing a lot more research than you ever, that the audience ever learns about. You know, you're creating the character and letting it come out through you. And the same with creating characters for a novel. You're bringing it through all your experience, everybody you've ever met, everybody you've seen, people watching in restaurants, uh, your own personal foibles and uh, what have you. You're bringing all that into the characters, but you're also now writing the story. Yeah. So it's it's a little bit more involved, but it's very similar. That, that the art of it is very similar, I think. I think so too. And I think developing characters is probably one of my favorite parts of writing, yeah. which is funny because I have all these character ideas and, and it's usually my stories always start with characters. I mean, people are a big deal for me. That's, that's, 
again, psychology is what I studied was people and their behavior and, and why they do the things they do, their motivations and that kind of thing. So um, I've always loved developing characters and whether or not I use them in a story, I don't know. Um, but they always have a backstory. They always exist. And so that is, that's an aspect of storytelling and writing that I could just go on and on and on about. Is there, is there a, an aspect of writing that you could just, it captivates you to the point where you could just talk about it endlessly? Yeah, I, th I, I think, uh, certainly that characters and the relationship between acting and writing that kind of stuff but also uh the what if uh the what if are only limited by your imagination and you know people i i, I, I like to say uh people like stephen king always amaze me because one of my greatest examples of taking the what if and just going and going and going with it is, is the green mile you know what if there's a guy who's 108 years old and we're telling it in flashback what if he used to be a guard at death row? What if a magical guy comes into death row charged with a murder who was actually trying to help? And you go on and on. And what if this guy, uh, what if the warden's wife has, has a brain cancer so that this guy is needed for, and if you can do that, go on and on and on. Well past most writers would stop. They say, I've got enough for this one. And bring that all together so it makes sense, like Stephen King does. That's really fascinating to me. You know, the... I use I use a lot of what if in my project suicide that I came up and I came up with the idea for that about the suicide drug uh, from a cure for Alzheimer's. I was visiting my father-in-law every week. Uh, he passed away you know, about five years ago, I guess. And I was visiting him every week, and uh, he was struggling with dementia. It wasn't like Alzheimer's; it wasn't that severe, but you know he wouldn't know what time it is. He couldn't tell by looking outside that it was daytime and not nighttime. That kind of thing. And uh, I thought, boy, that's that's really a terrible thing. And I knew they were working on a cure. And I said, well, what if they came up with a cure? But what if it had a side effect? And now you get going with what ifs. And you say, okay, what would this side effect be? Well, what if, as your sense of self came back, it worked on a gene for self-preservation at the same time? That was the side effect. So a self-loathing came with it. So you would want to kill yourself while you were coming back to your realization of what was your life around you. And then the big what if was, what if you gave it to a person who didn't have dementia? They would still want to kill themselves. Wouldn't that be a great assassination drug? I mean, you are completely removed from it as the assassin. They did it to themselves. How can you be suspected? So First of all, I'm going to be reading your book like as soon as possible because <laughs> I'm like sitting here going, what if? <laughs> like the, you, you've got me hooked. So I'm, I'm in it to win it on this. So. Now, do you think the what if um, process works with any genre or do you think it's best used for like thriller and horror and that kind of thing? It works for any genre. Uh, it's most involved for, I would say, thriller or science fiction, especially science fiction. When you think of, uh, like I said, science fiction is that little book of science and then a whole lot of speculation. Uh, what if there, you could do matter transport? You know, what if, uh, you know, warp drive existed? All of these things that you can then make Star Trek. And uh, so I think it's for thrillers, uh, for anything fast-paced, it's, it's, it's bigger. But all stories use it to a greater or lesser degree. Uh, use something like Bridges of Madison County. That's what if there was a woman who's, who's disgruntled in her life, and what if this artist comes in? You know, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's used in everything. But it's probably most involved in thrillers, uh, mystery stories, science fiction, horror well, yeah. I like it. It's, and it's a great way to think about things because, you know, if you can answer the question, then you, that means you're going to have the audience or your, your readers asking the question first, and then you're going to provide the answer. And so that's, I like that method. That's pretty good. The idea of going back to method, um, they typically, and this is a generalization, but they typically want writers, especially thriller, thriller writers, but any writers into two groups, the plotters, the ones who write an outline first and the pantsers, the ones who go out the seat of their pants and just go, get an idea, and they go with it. And not surprisingly, many more thriller writers, I think, are, I, I am, a pantser, because it's this idea of you discovering it along with the reader. You know, if it's a surprise to you, it's going to be a surprise to someone else. I heard a best-selling thriller writer, I think this was at uh, Thriller Fest, and he said, people say, oh, I don't want to write myself. If I don't have an outline, I can write myself into a corner. He goes, I love writing myself into a corner, because I have to come up with a way out. There's always a way out of any corner. And if you can come up with a really creative way out, then the reader's going to say, wow, I didn't think of that. 
So yeah, there's uh, that that enters into it as well. I love it. Yeah, I'm I'm a pantser through and through, and uh, my first two are romantic suspense books, and so it was. I asked that question a lot. What if without actually asking that question, like that was just the way my brain processed the story was like, there were questions right. that I needed answering, but, but that's technically what you're doing is saying, okay, what if, or how does, you know, asking the questions and then answering them, that is a very good way to write a good suspense or a thriller and that kind of thing. Um, actually going along with the, what if there was a, there was a kind of a big, what if for my second book checkout time, which is, which is about a, uh, uh, arsonist extortionist who's looking to make money from uh, uh, hotels, hotel chain. And I came up with the idea for that when I was actually doing in a, in a business uh, travel thing probably about 15 years ago. I looked up at the ceiling of the hotel room that was on the top floor and there was a trap door. And it was one of these kind of things that just had like a little button you could turn and it would open up. And I said, boy, somebody could put something up in there. Well, what? The what if? What would you put in there? Well, you could put uh, microfilm or something like that. You have a spy for it. You could put mob money, and you have the man who has the money suddenly fall at his feet one day. And like, wow, now he's going to be pursued by the mob, whatever. My bet was to say, put a bomb in there. I grew up, I was a bit of a pyro. I loved uh, firecrackers. I loved making my own gunpowder, all that stuff. Anything that would boom or burn, I loved. <laughs> and uh, so you put a bomb up there. Well, why? What if? Well, what if the bomb was there as a message? pay me money or I'm going to keep doing this. And that was the genesis of uh, checkout time. That's awesome. I, that is ask questions and answer them. I mean, that's, that's what your audience is doing anyway. When they pick up the book, you know, they're like, you know, even if it's a romance, you know, it's like, Oh, will they, or won't they, you know, will second yeah. chance or the end of it, you know, so always ask the question and then answer it. And, and that's, that's how you write a story usually. And right. so if you get stuck, ask a question. Right. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So we are at the portion of the show where it is open floor. Anything else? What do you want to talk about? You, you name the topic. Okay. Well, uh, anything else? What, 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 what have we gone over so far? I've got some notes here. Let's, let's go back to, to research. We talked okay. about old school where you used to have to, you know, go and talk to people and stuff like that. And, and Google and Google Maps and all those things have kind of, made that a lot easier. That being said, just like with acting, old school can still really be helpful to add that authenticity. When I, as an example, when I was working on checkout time, and it involves a, uh, a handsome government researcher like myself, <laughs> who uh, he's in the same hotel room or same, same hotel floor where the first bomb goes off. And it just so happens a beautiful FBI agent is also on that floor. So she becomes involved in the investigation, and he becomes involved by proxy. And uh, so I knew the FBI was going to be involved, and there would be some scenes in FBI offices and FBI procedure. And you think, well, you can wing that. You can use what the public already knows. That's another thing about research. Use what's already in the public imagination. If, uh, if, the, if the people believe the legend, write the legend. Uh, so people have seen Silence of the Lambs. They've seen... Uh, Manhunter or Red Dragon and the FBI TV shows, all the things where you see FBI procedures and see FBI offices, you can just go with that. And that would probably work okay. But I wanted it to be a little bit more. So I knew I would be involved with the FBI Knoxville field office and the FBI Cincinnati field offices. FBI has, if you don't know it, uh, they have field offices, kind of big centers, scattered, probably about 25 of them scattered around the country. Not every state has one. But, and then there's other things called resident agencies, which are smaller satellites of the field offices. So Dakota may only have a resident agency. They may not have a field office. So I knew I'd be involved with those two field offices. So I said, wouldn't it be nice to, to see what they look like? So I contacted the uh, both through uh, messages to the public relations offices of both FBI field offices and said, can I get a tour? And Cincinnati said no. They said the special agent in charge, and they're all special agents. It's not your FBI agent and your special FBI agent. You're a special agent. You're a special agent in charge. You're the assistant special agent in charge, like that. And they decide if you if someone can come and see the facility, and they said no. And Knoxville said, sure, what do you want to do it? I don't know if it's because Southerners are more uh, uh, accommodating. We so I, set, <laughs> I, I set it up probably, I think it was like 2018 or something like that. Uh, and I got a one-hour guided tour of the Knoxville one summer for the Knoxville FBI field office. Met the special agent in charge. Very nice uh, lady who uh, shook my hand. And I'm sure if she tried a little harder, I would grimace. 
because she she had a grip. Um, got to speak with the armorer about weapons. Got to see all four floors that they use, or actually uh, five floors, but one of them they weren't using was for storage. Uh, got to see the big uh, room with all the TV screens and stuff when they're on a big case, and they're getting feed in, you know, feed, feedback from all over the country. Spoke with the operators and the uh, we, we talked to the public, all that stuff, and got some very nice details. Saw uh, my biggest impression going in is when you enter uh, the Knoxville Field Office, you walk up a, a bush line or shrub line walkway to the gate and you show your, your, your you know you get a temporary pass then you go through another gate unlocks and you walk up some more and you enter this kind of rotunda and it's all polished uh, like mahogany around the sides with benches and leather and on the floor there is a tile uh, marble mosaic of the FBI seal and on this wall there's the wall of heroes where they have a TV screen with all the agents who have died and, that's really impressive. You feel the pomp and circumstance of the FBI when you come into that room. And so little details like that went into checkout time. And again, not a lot, just enough to give that feeling of this guy really knows what he's talking about. Yeah, it adds legitimacy to it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and and if you don't know what you're talking about, like a quick Google will tell you most anything you need right. to know. So like if, if you really want to add that extra something, know right. what you're saying. <laughs> You know, for example, a lot of people write stuff about uh, about firearms. They write the thriller. They're writing a uh, mm -hmm. military drama, what have you. And there's a lot, a lot of people who know about firearms. And if you don't, instead of writing something stupid like Stephen King does, I, I love his writing, but he'll do stupid things like he'll say uh, he he clicked the safety off his clock. Clocks don't have a manual safety. <laughs> he, he screwed. He, he shoved the silencer on his revolver. You can't use a silencer <laughs> on a revolver. Go talk to somebody at gun shop. They love to talk guns, you know, go, go to a gun shop, go to a gun show, uh, you know, something like that. You know, you, instead of making your writing sound silly, give them that feeling that you actually know what you're talking about. Yes, use it as an opportunity even to educate your reader. As and, reader. Again, that education is great. And that's one thing I like about Michael Crichton that I try to put in my books. But again, you have to realize that you're not there to educate, you're there to entertain. It's a thriller. Yes. And it's not about the research, it's about the characters and the trials and tribulations they're going through. And that's where I think Mitchner gets it wrong sometimes. And Michael Crichton usually gets it right. There's just enough education that you yes. want to truly need. Yes, I agree. My dad was a police officer for um, several years when I was much younger. And so, and he is, he is a gun aficionado and now he's the chaplain for the police department in the city oh, they live right. in. And so, um, you know, he's, I've got I've got my resource there, and so in my second book, the main one of the main characters, he's the sheriff of a small town, and I was like, I need to know if you were to walk in on a hostage situation, how are you going to take this guy down? And so he, ex you know, told me all these things and exactly how you would. You're not just going to walk in and be like, drop the gun. You know, there there there's a nuance yeah. to it, and I was like, what's for writing my scene? What exactly. Yes. I, I I I've written a book which is like in the third draft, and. It's what I call pre pre apocalyptic. It's not it's not after the apocalypse. It's how does it start? And I titled it not with a whimper, because you know how will how the world end? Not with a bang with a whimper. Well, mine's not with a whimper. You know, it's going to be this series of events. And I might tr I might try to publish it at some point, um, but it's kind of sprawling. There's a whole different things that interact to cause this to happen. And one of the things in there is there's a terrorist attack from a small plane. And I wanted some realistic, you know, how does it sound when you're in a plane? What goes on? So fortunately, my brother-in-law is a private pilot. And he has the same kind of plane I put in the book. So I said to him, what happens when you're taxiing? What does it sound like going back and forth to the... Uh, and, and he gave me a bunch of sample dialogue when they're talking to uh, pilots getting ready to take off and stuff like that. And uh, he also read through the sections that were technical and told me, well, this, you couldn't do this, you know, stuff. So it's things like that. It's old school. But, and even when you don't include stuff, the fact that you did the research, it's like doing a character biography and acting. The fact that you did the research shows up in the writing, even though you don't put the details in. 100%. I think, and I think that is um, something that is so easy to do because, you know, like 
like we said, there is the old school way. Like we did use encyclopedias when I was in school. Like that was how you did your research and your card catalogs and that kind of thing. It wasn't until I was in high school when they really went digital with all um, the, the Dewey Decimal System became no longer those cute little cards. And so, um, you know, being able to just log on and say, what would it look like if, for instance, I have a tour of the Washington Cathedral in my, in my first book and so I've been there but it's been so long so I took a video walking tour through the cathedral you know so yeah. so simple but it also helped me to connect emotionally and therefore I know that it was in my writing as well right and you know it's it's so much just like things like like using a google maps or a yes. map quest global view of a location that you want you, you want to yes. talk about what are the street names what businesses are nearby how much tree cover is there, you know? And not many people will know the area well enough that they're going to say, wait a minute, that's not the case. But even if they don't, it's going to come through that, wow, this is this is something this guy knows about. Yes, and and why wouldn't you want to look like, even if you're not an expert, you are the author, therefore you need to look right. like the expert because you are conveying an inf information and message. Let's tell listeners how they can connect with you and your work, because I need to know exactly where to go pick up your first book, <laughs> like okay. yesterday. Okay, great. Um, my, you can find links to this about everything on my website, which is uh, thrillerjohnb.net. So it's just thrillerjohnb, J-O-H-N-B, my last name, or my first name, .net. You can get the easiest way to get to both Project Suicide and Checkout Times are available on Amazon, they're available at Barnes & Noble, uh, they're distributed by... Uh, a large distributor, so there's any, any place you wanted to get them, they could order them. Um, the easiest way to get to Amazon is projectsuicidenovel.com, all one word, okay. or checkouttimenovel.com, all one word. And this will get you right to the pages. Um, you can order them, they're available on Kindle, which is very reasonable, uh, and paperback and hardcover. So, uh, so yeah, that's that's the easiest way to do that. Very good, and, and are you on social there, media? Uh, social media, yeah, Facebook. You find me on Facebook. Follow me on Facebook. Uh, I don't use Twitter as much. Uh, I'm old school because you know Twitter. It's just little tiny driblets. But I am on Twitter at uh, at I think it's at Jabukau 2000 and I can't remember the thing now. Anyway, but you can find me. There's my name on Twitter. You can, you can pick me up. Okay, yeah, well, and I'll make sure that all of that's in the show notes so that it's just as easy as a click and they can find you on all of the platforms and, and, and links directly to your books. And anybody out there has a book club or something like that in the Midwest, Eastern Tennessee, I'm in Ohio a lot, I'm in Eastern Tennessee a lot, uh, uh, be glad to come and, and speak with you, uh, either of my books. I've had a couple of uh, book clubs do some of my books, and they've been very pleased with them, so. That's very cool. That's a really cool offer, too, to be able to say, hey, you can call me up and I'll come talk about my books and yeah, just books in could, general. Or we could do it virtual like we're doing here. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, what is one piece of advice or encouragement that if listeners hear nothing else, you want them to walk away with? If anybody who wants to write, write. Um, like I said, you've got to, there's two things you got to do. You've got to read a lot because reading fiction, especially in the genre you want to write in, but reading in general, is the way you learn. Uh, Stephen King likes to say that writing can be learned, it can't be taught. And one of the ways you do that is you learn how people who are good at writing do it and learn to read like a writer. And you gotta write a lot. You know, like you say, there's no such thing as plumber's block. If a uh, plumber doesn't feel like going to work, he still goes to work. Uh, if you don't really feel like writing, try to write something. Uh, some days are gonna be better than others, but uh, don't get discouraged. That's easy to do. There's a lot of rejection. A lot and lots and lots and lots. It's all rejection, basically. It's like acting. It's all rejection with an occasional glimmer or nugget. I, I send so short stories out to, uh, I'm the kind of guy who I write short stories I want to write, and then I look for publications that might like it. I don't write for the publication, you know. But so I send them out all the time, and it's when you get an acceptance that it's, it's a shock because you're so used to seeing the rejections. But as soon as you see the, the you know, it's from a certain, uh, publisher, you go, oh, there's another one I can scratch off the list. And occasionally it's like, wow, they actually want it. <laughs> so there's lots of rejection. Don't get discouraged. Um, and it's something that you have to treat like a business and a hobby. You have to do it because you love it because, like acting, it's mostly rejection. But you have to do it religiously. 
quite busy. And when you do get something published, you have to market it because the publisher never does it for you. Oh my goodness. And that is a whole other, like we could spend a whole other hour talking oh, yeah. about how to yeah. market and how to get, and maybe we should schedule that. I think we should make that happen too. But like it, we could I, spend I forever. Sure Me neither. But you know, I'm always looking for somebody to be like, okay, I've tried this. What have you tried and has it worked? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, John, thank you so much for being here today and hanging out with me. And I, I well, look forward to like I am yeah, I am picking up your book like as soon it will probably be this weekend when I get to sit down and read again, but I am that is at the top of my list now. <laughs> Great. Appreciate it. And uh, also if anybody out there, if you like somebody's writing, leave an Amazon review. Yes. Uh, we we, we thrive on reviews, yes. yes. They, they mean a lot more than people know. Not only do people buy the books based on the review. How Amazon places it in their marketing depends on the review and the number of views and quality reviews. So it's very important. Absolutely. Even if it's, you know, hey, this was a great book, like just to yeah. let us know, to let Amazon know, hey, I picked it up and it's worth continuing to yeah. advertise and sell. And, and, and two lines. Anybody can do that. It takes five minutes. Yes. Yes. And it's not us wanting to know how much you love us. I mean, even if it's a negative review, I mean, yeah. I, I don't want to see it, but <laughs> leave one. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. And I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. You too. Thank you.